All right, we are continuing here uh, in our series entitled The Apostle Paul and the Pauline Epistles. And two weeks ago, last week we were at camp, but two weeks ago we started out in Romans chapter 1. And does anybody know how far we got? We got through the first seven verses. We didn't get very far, did we? Uh, but let's go back to verse number 7, and then we'll kind of go from there. So Romans Chapter 1, verse number 7. We'll just do a quick review of at least verse number 7 and then go from there. Paul says this, he says, To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So basically everything prior to verse number 7 is a lengthy introduction to who Paul is. And that's perfectly fine because as believers, how many understand we must know who it is that is speaking into our lives? How many know there's 101 voices out there? No, there's 1,001 voices out there. Everybody's wanting a piece of the action. Everybody's wanting to speak into us. Everybody's wanting to influence us. How many know that there's a, the world is full of influencers? Most of them are evil. Most of them are bad. And so we've got to know who it is that is speaking into our lives. And that's why Paul makes uh, an introduction of who he is. And, and so this is still a very valid point today because we need to understand uh, who it is that is speaking into our lives. We need to uh, be careful of who we allow to lay hands on us, uh, even to pray over us, because uh, we just don't want any funny business going on. Can anybody, anybody say amen? I mean, the devil has come up into the church house now. Uh, we talk about deception. It's not the deception from the world that we need to worry about. It's the deception within the church, because uh, Satan comes as an angel of light. He comes as a wolf in sheep's clothing, and the Bible tells us this. And I know we don't necessarily like to talk about that because we don't want to judge anybody or we don't want to alienate anybody, but I tell you what, we've got to know. We've got to know because the Bible says this. The Bible says, try the spirits. Try the spirits. Somebody says, well, you're not, you know, you're not supposed to judge. Well, there is a righteous judgment. The Bible says we can make a righteous judgment. And so we've got to be careful uh, of who we allow to speak into our lives. And so that's why the Apostle Paul goes to great lengths to explain who he is and what he's doing and what his motives are. So beginning here in verse number 7, Paul greets the Roman Christians in his characteristic way. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So here we see that it is the grace of God. Everybody say the grace of God. It is the grace of God that leads us into the peace of God. One of the things that the devil has come to steal right now in this time in which we live, this season, is the peace in our mind. We know that John 10.10 10 says that, that the devil, the thief, the enemy, the only reason he has come is to steal, kill, and destroy. And one of the things that he wants is your peace. And how many understand, if you let him in your head, he's going to take your peace? Right? Yeah. He's going to take your peace. We like to say it like this. No God, N-O-G, N-O-G, N-O God. No God, no peace. But if we know God, K-N-O-W, then we will know peace. Does that make sense? No God, no peace. But if we really do know God, then we can know peace. Amen. How many are thankful for the peace of God? Amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding. It doesn't matter what we're going through, if we might be smack right dab in the middle of the storm, but how many know we can have the peace of God that passes all understanding? Amen. So it's the grace of God that leads us into the peace of God. We could say it like this. Grace was afforded to us at the cross, right? Does that make sense? Grace was afforded to us at the cross, but the peace of God is a process. Let me say that again. 
The grace of God was afforded to us at the cross, but the peace of God is a process. And the reason being is the peace of God comes to us as we grow in Christ. How many understand when you were first saved, as soon as you were saved, the enemy came to you to try to steal your salvation experience? In fact, he would try to make us doubt if we were even saved. Did that even, did that even happen to anybody? Sure, that happens to all of us, and, and not just new believers. The devil tries the same old tricks all the time, doesn't he? But the peace of God comes to us in a process. The process of sanctification, everybody say sanctification. The process of sanctification produces peace in our lives. It produces peace as we learn who God is. How many know we serve a good, good father? Nothing but good, right? All things are working together for our good, right? So we learn that. that that's through the sanctification process. Peace comes into our lives when we learn that God is good, that God is for us. And then peace also comes into our lives when we realize who we are in Christ. How many know you're not an accident going somewhere to happen? You're not a second thought. You're not a second class citizen in the kingdom of God. Come on, somebody. But guess what? God only has sons and daughters, right? No grandchildren. No, no. Yeah. So peace comes to us when we learn who God is. And then peace comes to us when we learn who we are in Christ. Now, we know what Paul told Timothy over here in 2 Timothy. Let's look at it here. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of what? Fear. fear. And how many know fear is real? Fear is very evident in our world today. Uh, but I like to say it like this, and I'm sure you've heard it, F-E-A-R, fear, it stands for false evidence appearing real, right? False evidence appearing real. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and what? Ah, a sound mind, a sound mind. And so, a part of that sound mind is having the peace of God. How many know we really can't have a sound mind if we don't have the peace of God? Listen, if we don't have the peace of God, we're going to be all over the page. We're going to be over here. We're going to be over there. Our mind is going to be constantly racing. We're just going to be overthinking situations. We're going to be over-talking. We're going to be overdoing. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, because that... Have you ever had that situation where your mind just wouldn't rest? Your mind just wouldn't shut off? That's when we need to pray for the peace of God because that's an attack from the enemy. Because how many understand God wants us to have peace and he wants us to have rest? Amen? And so a part of the, the sound mind that Paul talks about here is the peace of God. And I'm thankful for the peace of God. Amen? Amen? The peace of God that passes all understanding. All right, now let's go back to verse number 8. Romans chapter 1, verse number 8. Paul continues here. He says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. That your faith is, watch this now. That your faith is spoken of where? Throughout the world. Wow. Wow. Your faith is spoken of throughout the world. So we see here that Paul is giving thanks to God for the church in Rome, and not only the church themselves, but their testimony. How many know we all have a testimony? It's our story for his glory. There it is. And so uh, the news of their faith was being reported throughout all the world, meaning that the church in Rome were not secret agent Christians. Hello? They weren't underground Christians, but rather they, they went public with their faith. They put it out there on Front Street, didn't they? 
The church in Rome weren't secret agent Christians, but they were public believers. How many know that it's time for the church to go public with our faith? We live in a world today where everything is out there in the open, right? Um, how, how do we say it? Nothing is sacred anymore. The devil is bold and loud, right? And, and he's going to push his agenda. And it's no time for the church to be timid. In fact, the Bible says the righteous are bold as a what? As a lion and the wicked flees with no one pursuing him. And so um, just as the church in Rome went public with their faith, it's time for us to go public with our faith. How many know we have what the world needs and his name is? Jesus. Jesus, right? We can't keep this to ourselves. Look at your neighbor and tell them, we can't keep this to ourselves. Well, I, I guess we could. But we shouldn't, right? We've got to share this. This is too good to keep within the four walls of the church, amen? For God so loved, amen, amen. So the, the, the Christians in Rome were open in their testimony, just as all ch churches and, and believers should be today. And so the result of that public confession, because how many know salvation is a public confession, right? God has no secret agents, does he? So the result of that public confession was obvious and the gospel was spreading because of it. Think of that. Because they were willing to share their faith, even while they lived in Rome, when that could have been dangerous for them, they chose to share their faith. Can somebody say hallelujah? Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. And then Paul goes on to say this in Romans chapter 16, verse 19. He says, for your what? For your obedience has become known to all. Look at that. Sometimes we think, oh, how can we spread the gospel? How can we do this? How can we do that? Can I, can I say all we need to do is be faithful and be obedient? How many understand we don't build the church of God? Oh, I, 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 know, I know God uses us. We make efforts and attempts. I, I get that. But ultimately, it's his church to build, right? Some plant the seed, some water, but it's God who gives the increase, right? And then at some point in time, somebody comes along and reaps that harvest. So ultimately, we can't build the church. It's God that does that. And so what we need to be, we just simply need to be faithful to the call. Because how many understand each and every one of us have a call on our lives? All we need to be is faithful and obedient. And guess what? God will do the rest. How many understand God doesn't need our help? He just needs our obedience. Because how many understand he can work with obedience? Oh, I promise you, he can work with obedience. So, Paul says, for your obedience has become known to all. In other words, the world is watching. <laughs> the world is watching. And when we obey what the Lord has told us to do, when we obey the word of God, then guess what? That gets the world's attention. Why? Because things happen when we obey the God, when, when we obey the word of God. Things happen when we remain faithful to the call of God. And when that happens, it gets the world's attention. When we obey God, God uses us, he blesses us, and the world takes notice. Amen? All right, back to verse 9. Romans chapter 1, verse 9. Paul continues here. He says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit, in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make what? Mention. I make mention of you how often? I make mention of you always in my prayers. So it's obvious that Paul not only had an apostolic mantle and mandate on his life and on his ministry, but he also carried a true burden for the church in Rome. But not only did he carry a burden for the church in Rome, but he carried a burden for all the churches he ministered to. Amen? 
How many understand Paul was a man of, of prayer? And uh, his, his prayers made a difference. And I say that, not meaning that ours don't, but this is what the Bible says about our prayers. The fervent, effectual prayer of a what? Of a righteous man avails much. Now, how many understand we can't make ourselves righteous? Our righteousness is as filthy rags. And so because of that, God imputed his righteousness to us, or in other words, he gave us his righteousness. So if we think about that fact and plug that into this verse right here, the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man avails much. How many understand God does the righteous part of it? We do the fervent, effectual part of it. Does that make sense? Our prayers are to be fervent. They are to be effectual. They are to be heartfelt. How many understand we just don't pray a prayer that's hollow, that doesn't mean anything to it, that, that we just speak of words of ritual or the same words that we repeat time and time again? Now, obviously, we can pray for the same things day after day. How many pray for the same things day after day? I pray for a lot of the same things. And so I'm not saying that's wrong, but what I am saying is our prayers need to be fervent. They need to be effectual. They need to be heartfelt. It's not just something that we just spout off or just go through the motions. Does that make sense to anybody? And I tell you, Paul had to be an intercessor. He had to be a prayer warrior. And when he prayed for you, how many know uh, that was a blessing? How many are thankful when somebody prays for you? Amen, I'm thankful. I'll, I'll take all the prayers I can get. And so, Paul carried a true burden for the church in Rome, but he carried a, a true burden for all the churches, everyone that he ministered to. And so, if we look in 1 Thessalonians, we see an example of this, of, of what Paul said to the church in Thessalonica. Let's look at that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. He says, for what thanks can we render to God for you, for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake? Wow. How many know as believers we can go before the throne of grace on the behalf of others? We can. We can. And he says, with which we rejoice for your sake before our God, how often? Night and day. Praying how? Ah, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Wow, what a heart for the church. What a heart for the church. How many believe Paul loved the church of Jesus Christ? I promise you he did. He, he gave his life for it. He that, that I may spin and be spent for the cause of Christ. Amen? And so we know that Paul had, obviously, he had a strong prayer life, and, and the churches he served and ministered to were mentioned daily in his prayers. In fact, he said day and night, day and night. And this is proof that Paul had the heart of a true apostle. A true apostle. Amen? Verse 10. Romans chapter 1, verse 10. Paul continues here. He says, making request. What is a request? When we request something, what is that? Ask. There you go. It's not, a, or I'm going to do this, but a request is, May I? Can I? Okay. Making requests, Paul says, if by some means, now at last, I may find a way in my own means. Is that what he said? No. no. That I may find a way, how? In the will of God to come to you. Now, this is, this is a very important verse right here. That I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. So
So when Paul says he is making a request here, it means that he's praying. He's asking that God will make it possible for him to go to Rome. And then we know that Acts chapters 27 and 28 record that journey, don't they? Oh my goodness, what a, what a wonderful story that is. Wow. And then why, why was Paul so intent on visiting the church in Rome? Well, we find the answer to that question here in verse 11. He says, for I long to see you that I may impart, everybody say impart, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be what? So that you may be established. And what, what is it that they would be established in? They would be established in the faith. Amen? They would be established in the message of the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, there's a, a little bit of confusion or misinterpretation sometimes of this particular scripture here in verse number 11. Because the, Paul, the Apostle Paul makes the statement that I may impart to you some spiritual gift. But now, how many understand that Paul was not able by himself to impart one or more of the gifts of the Spirit to them? How many understand those gifts are not man's to give out? But they are God's, right? Right? But what he is imparting here, what, what he's talking about, he, he, he wants to impart to them truth. He wants to impart into them revelation. He wants to impart into them encouragement. And how many know all those are gifts? Paul himself was not only a gift to the body of Christ, but what he gave, what he imparted were truly gifts. You see, you see, the gifts of the Spirit, and, and again, sometimes we get a little carried away in our charismatic Pentecostal circles and we need to be reeled back in every once in a while, but the gifts of the Spirit, as valuable as they are, they do not establish anyone. Does that make sense? The gifts of the Spirit do not establish us. There are only... Two things that establish us as believers. And the two things that are establish us are simply this. The word of God and a right relationship with him. Now obviously prayer, our prayer language, going to church, all those things are important too. But that would, that would kind of fall under the category of a right relationship. Okay, So really there are only two things that establish us as believers. The word of God and a right relationship. So first of all, the word is the most important establisher. Establisher. If that's not a word, we just made it a word. How many understand we can't be any more spiritual than what we are scriptural? Hello? We can't be any more spiritual than what we are scriptural. Some people are spiritual, but how many know they're weird? Because they don't have a scriptural basis. Or they go overboard, right? Uh, how many know we live in a very, very spiritual world? I promise you we live in a very spiritual world, whether we realize that or not. But how many know our, all spirits are not good? In fact, how many know the devil is very spiritual? The devil is a spirit, right? Uh, the, the devil is spiritual, but he, he's obviously not scripturally sound, right? And, and so it's not enough just to be spiritual, but how are we established? How are we established? Um, 
Again, the most important establisher is the word. Look what Jesus said here in John chapter 8, verse 32. And you shall hear about the truth sometimes, occasionally. No. And you shall what? No. No. How many know it's, it's one thing to hear about something, but it's whole another something to know it? How many know we have a no-so salvation? We don't have to guess about this. We don't have to surmise. No. He said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So in other words, it's not just the truth by itself that sets us free. But it's the truth that we know, that we live by, that we apply to our lives on a daily basis. Did that make sense? How many understand the biggest King James Bible sitting on your coffee table doesn't do your home any good if you don't ever open that thing up and read it? Your word have I what? Hid in my heart. So when the evil day comes, I will not sin against you. His word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. But if we don't ever get in the word, but here's another level. If we don't ever allow the word to get into us, it doesn't do us any good. And by the way, while we're talking about the word, how many understand we were talking about praying? We just can't pray generic prayers. We just can't pray from our minds and not our hearts. But how many understand we can't read this book like a textbook? We can't read this book with our head. We've got to read it with our heart. In fact, the best thing we can do before we open up the Bible is pray. Pray. Say, Lord, open up your word to me. Give me that revelation. Amen? So you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And so the word is what establishes us as believers. But then there's another key component that establishes us, and that's a right relationship and everything or or, or I should say so many things fall under that category of a right relationship let's look at it here let's look what Jesus said about a right relationship here in Matthew chapter 7 again I'm going to say this and I'm not trying to say it to make anybody mad or offended by I'm not I'm not thinking about anybody when I say it. I'm not talking about anybody. But again, in our charismatic, Pentecostal, spirit-filled ranks, we put so much emphasis on the signs, the wonders, the healings, the miracles, the this, the that, and the other. And, And don't get me wrong. I believe in all that. You know I do. But watch what Jesus says here. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who what? He who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now watch this. A few or some. Verse 22. Many. Everybody say many. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not what? Ah, come on now. Have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? In other words, They thought if they were used by God, then that means God's stamp of approval was upon him. How many know God is the only employer who will fire you and let you keep working? Hello? I promise you there are a lot of Christians who have been fired, but they don't know it, but they just keep doing the work of the kingdom. And God, to a certain extent, blesses that because he honors his word. But but they say, many will say to me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? But what does Jesus say? Verse 23. And then I will declare, declare to them, I never what? Wow. I never knew you. In other words, I never had that intimate, living, loving relationship with you. Because how many understand that's really what he wants from us? You see, we get it wrong. We think he wants the things that we can do for him. But how many know 
he spoke, he spoke through a donkey one time. He could send an angel to do what we're doing. Or, or he could just speak the word and it could be done. So yeah, what we do for the kingdom is important. It's valuable, but it, it's not who we are. It's not our identity. Does that make sense? Now, that doesn't mean we sit down and do nothing, but what we do doesn't identify us. It doesn't validate us. Uh, some people come into the church and they think, oh, if I could just do this, if I could just be a prophet, if I could just, 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 just. No, just sit down. God loves you anyway, just the way you are. Now, does he want to use you? Yes, but we've got to get, we've got to get the relationship right. How many understand we can't love being used by God more than we love God himself? We can't love the work of God more than we love the Lord of the work. All right. He says, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Lawlessness. How many know we have a spirit of lawlessness running rampant today in our world? Wow. Wow. Spiritual lawless, lawlessness and spiritual lawlessness, physical and spiritual. So uh, a knowledge of the word of God and a right relationship is what establishes us. Does that make sense? Do, do we get that? I, I want us to really get that because, again, it, it's not what we do, it's who we are. He wants us. Look at your neighbor and tell him, he wants you. He, he, want, he appreciates the fact that you work for him and do good things. But the number one thing with, with, with God is he wants that relationship. He wants that time. I mean, because if we go back to the beginning, we think about this in Genesis in the Garden of Eden. God just simply come down and, and in the cool of the day and he talked and he fellowshiped with Adam and Eve. There was no work to be done. There were, no, there were no souls to be saved, right? But he just simply fellowshiped. Oh, wow, isn't that beautiful? How many are thankful you can have a personal relationship with him? <laughs> Woo! And see, we've got to be careful because as Christians, sometimes we get so busy doing the work of the kingdom, we forget about the king of the kingdom. Right? We, we forget the fact that he wants us. All right, verse 12, back to Romans chapter 1. Paul continues here, and he's given a reason, reason why he wants to come to Rome. He says, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you. Ah, what? Paul, but I thought you had so many things to impart. I thought you had so many things to give and to say. But notice what he says here in verse 12. He says that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith. Everybody say the mutual faith. By the mutual faith, both of you and me. Wow. Isn't that awesome? So Paul says that I may be encouraged together with you. How many know ministers need ministered to? Pastors need pastors. Come on, somebody. Wow. And so he says that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. What do we, what do we always say? When God ministers through us, he ministers to us. In fact, the best thing for us if we're down, discouraged, if we're distracted, the best thing we can do is find somebody that needs ministered to and pour into their lives and watch what happens to you. You forget about your own problems. Come on, somebody. And as God ministers through us, he ministers to us, to us. So Paul's words here model a healthy relationship between minister and church. Amen? Amen. He wants them to be mutually encouraged by each other. I like to say it like this, the body ministering to the body. How many understand we don't need anything else? We don't need any outside influence. We don't need anything the world has to offer us 
Watch this now. All we need is Jesus, the Word, and each other. Come on, somebody. Woo! <laughs> Let me say that again. All we need is Jesus, the Word, and each other. Look at your neighbor and tell him, I'm here for you. And I hope you're here for me. Amen? So Paul wants them to be mutually encouraged by each other. The Bible calls it like this, iron sharpening iron. Iron sharpening iron. So Paul loves on them, he ministers to them, and they love on and minister to Paul. How many know that's the way it's supposed to be? So it, it, it's not just about giving. It's not just about doing ministry or giving ministry, but receiving ministry, right? Because how many understand, as a minister myself, if I don't ever take in if I don't ever allow myself to be ministered to, then how many understand I don't have anything to offer you? That makes sense? <laughs> so it's not always about giving, but receiving ministry. Now, obviously, as Christians, we talk a lot about giving, right? And rightfully so. We are to live sacrificial lives and so on and so forth. But it's not always about the giving, is it? Look at this in John. John chapter 1, verse number 12. All right, anybody getting anything out of this so far? Good deal, good deal. That's what we want. John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as what? Ah, there it is. But as many as received him, to them he gave the what? Ah, he gave them the right, he gave them the power, he gave them the ability to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. Wow. So not only must we learn to be good givers, but we've got to be good receivers. Amen? How many know we're not, we're not a dam, but we're a river? Right? We're not to become stagnant, but life is to flow through us. How many know we are a conduit for the power of God in our lives? We are a channel. How many want to be a channel for the river of God? Woo. So not only good givers, but good, good receivers. All right, verse, verse 13. I'm going to wind this down here. Back to Romans chapter 1, verse number 13. Paul continues, he says, Now I do not want you to be unaware. King James Version says, I would not have you ignorant, brethren. And that's a, a phrase that is often used by Paul. That I often plan to come to you, but was what? Hindered. Think about that. The great apostle Paul. The great <laughs> Apostle Paul, even he himself was hindered. That I often planned to come to you, but was hindered unto now, that I may have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. And again, a Gentile is just somebody who's not a Jew. So we see here that even... The great apostle Paul was hindered at times in his ministry. How many know sometimes when the enemy attacks us, every once in a while we kind of take it personal? And we get that little pity party and we think, oh, you know, it's just, it's just me and, and, and the devil's out to get me. No, how many know it, it's just the God inside of us that he hates? Yeah. Yeah. We're just kind of caught in the middle of this battle between good and evil, God and Satan. And, and, and so I know sometimes we take these attacks personally, but really it's just because God is using us. And Paul was the same way. At times he was hindered by the enemy. Many times before Paul wanted to make the trip to Rome, but for whatever reasons... It did not happen. Now, obviously, it could have been an issue of timing. Everybody say timing. 
Because how many understand that it, if it's really God's will, then how many understand God's going to make a way for it to happen? <laughs> I'm sorry, the gates of hell shall not prevail. <laughs> if it's really God's will, it's going to happen. We're not going to stand in the way. The devil ain't going to stand in the way. And, and, and so perhaps it was an issue of timing. As believers, we must be conscious of this element called time and the timing of God. Because how many understand the timing of God is just as important as the will of God, right? Because if we're out of God's timing, then guess what? Really, we're out of his perfect will. No matter how good our intentions are, no matter what we might be trying to make happen. How many know sometimes we want to... We want people to get saved so badly that sometimes we try to push that issue, don't we? But, we, but we've got to be so careful there because if we're not careful, how many understand we can actually turn people off? Remember? We've we got to remember the process here. It's a process. Some plant the seed, some water. God gives the increase, and at another time, somebody comes along and reaps that harvest. So don't try to pull the plant up when it's not ready. Don't try to reap the harvest if it's not ripe. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So timing. Timing can be just as important as the will of God. And really, basically, if we're out of God's timing, then, then we're out of his will. No matter what our intention is, we've got to... How many... <laughs> How many has ever, you've gone through this process of waiting and God just made you wait on something? It's not pleasant, is it? Sometimes it's a good, well, most of the time, yeah. It's a good thing. We, we want to do this. We want that to happen. And for whatever reason, God makes us wait. But in our, in our patience, we possess our Souls, yes, yes, yes. And boy, we could just go on and on and say a whole lot more about patience and timing and so on and so forth, but I, I think we get it. All right, let's go back to Romans chapter 1 and we'll conclude here tonight with verse 14. Paul makes a very, very pow powerful statement here. He says, I am a what? What is a debtor? Oh, you owe. Oh. What was that old song? I owed a debt I could not pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. I needed somebody to wash my sins away. Now, it's not the fact that Paul is reverting back to the law or he's reverting back to works because how many understand it was Paul that gave us the revelation of grace? We're saved by grace through faith, not by works lest any man should boast. So when he, when he says the fact that he's a debtor, it, it, he's not recruiting us back to live under the law again or that we have to do this or have to do that or there's a long list but he simply means if Jesus gave us his all, how can we not give him our all? Does that make sense? I am a debtor, but not only am I a debtor to Christ, watch this now, I am a debtor both to who? Not to Jesus, not to heaven, but watch this. I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and otherwise. In other words, I'm a debtor to the lost, to the world, to those who don't know Jesus. We are in debt to them. Wow. Wow. I, I think for the most part, we know that we're in debt to Jesus for Bible salvation and eternal life. But Paul says we need to be in debt to the, the world that lives around us. How many believe the world deserves to hear about Jesus? Okay, let's take it another level. How many believe the world deserves 
to see somebody living like Jesus. Not just hear about it, but to see a Christian who lives the Christian life. Not just talks the talk, but walks the walk. How many times have we said, for so many people, we're the only Bible they will ever read and we're the only Jesus they will ever meet. I'm a debtor. I'm a debtor to those people that I come in contact with every day. I'm a debtor to them to share my faith. Wow. How many know that just takes everything to a whole nother level right there? So what Paul is saying here is that he is obligated. Everybody say obligated. He is obligated to preach the gospel. And that doesn't mean that he just has to stand behind a pulpit. and No, preach the gospel is proclaim it. Share his faith, right? Share the gospel. To preach the gospel to everyone. Why? Because everybody needs Jesus. Everybody. Everybody needs Jesus. Wow. And how many know really every Christian should feel this way right here? We should feel obligated. Not only to Christ, not only to heaven, but we should feel obligated to share the gospel with everyone we meet. We should all feel that we are a debtor to preach, to share, to live, to love with everyone we come in contact with. Wow. How many can say, Lord, help me? I, I, I need help in that area because, you know, so, so many times it's easier just to, what, go the other way? Look the other way? I mean, we're busy. We do life. You know, we get in a hurry sometimes. And wow. But God help us. Amen. Help us to see all the people around us that need Jesus. Paul said it like this, the Greeks, the barbarians, the wise, the unwise. Everyone deserves to hear the gospel message. We are so blessed in America. Oh my goodness, we've heard this gospel so many times. You can turn television on, Christian television, Christian radio, pamphlets, tracts. It's on the internet. I mean, it's just every church on every corner just about. But can I tell you, the greatest witness isn't necessarily the television program, the radio program, the internet. It's definitely not the church building, but the greatest witness is us. Us. We are that witness. We are that living example. Jesus said, we know this, when Jesus was here, he was the light of the world. But like we always say, Jesus isn't here anymore, but so now we are that light. We're the light of the world. We're the salt of the earth. We are that living example. Amen. How many want to be a, a good ambassador of heaven? We are. We are a representative of heaven. Because how many understand this world's not our home? We're pilgrims. We're strangers. We're, we're, we're really, we're aliens. That's why we don't fit in down here. Misfits, come on, Sister Linda. <laughs> well, we should listen, we shouldn't be comfortable in this world. We should not be comfortable in this world. And we should stick out like a sore thumb in a good way, right? Right? <laughs> we know what God's will is. It's it's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And how do people come to repentance? Somebody's got to preach the word. Somebody's got to share their faith. What does the Bible say? How shall they hear without a preacher? You say, well, I'm not a preacher. No, I'm not talking about a pastor. We're all preachers. How many know our lives preach messages every day? I promise you, every time we go to Walmart, every time we go to a school, every time we go to work, our life is preaching a message. I don't know about you, but I want my life to preach good messages, not just here, not just on Sunday, not just on Wednesday, but Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, right? Mm. Wow, what a responsibility, what an obligation. We see here that Paul is eager to preach the gospel to anyone and everyone, and so should we. Amen. Let's stand together. We'll stop there. Verse 14. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. 
Lord, we thank you that your word is forever settled in heaven. God, we thank you, Jesus, that we have the rock, the rock that the builders rejected. (laughs) And that rock, that stone has become the chief cornerstone. Lord, we not only base our lives on this book, but we base our eternities on this book. God, we thank you for the canon of truth. From Genesis to Revelation, the New Testament, the Old Testament, God, we're thankful for your word. And God, we're thankful for men and women of faith. God, we're thankful for the Apostle Paul, the stand that he took Lord, as the early church was birthed in the power of that, of that Pentecostal apostolic outpouring. And Lord, that is exactly what we need today. Lord, as we come to the close of the church age, Lord, the church needs to be restored in that Pentecostal apostolic power and authority, God. We need to be refreshed and revived. Lord, we need a fresh impartation of your Holy Spirit. And God, we're believing you for that. We're asking you for that, God, that you would pour out your Spirit afresh and anew. Lord, that you would revive us, O Lord. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with your holy fire from above. Lord, awaken us from our slumbering sleep. Lord, may we not be complacent. May may we not be weary in well-doing. But Lord, may we be encouraged tonight. Lord, may we be stirred. May our hearts be stirred. Lord, may, we, may that fire be rekindled. Lord, we ask you to rekindle that fire within us, Jesus. Lord, that we would blaze, that we would show forth your glory. Lord, that we would, um, Lord, that we would be a lighthouse, a city set on a hill whose light cannot be hid. Lord, that we would be bold. And Lord, even as it was said of the church of Rome, Lord, that we would be bold about our faith. Lord, that we would let it known, let it be known that we are Christians, that we believe in God, that we believe in the word of God. And Lord, we wouldn't be ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we would stand boldly and proclaim that Jesus Christ is the King of all kings. He is the Lord of all lords. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And he's coming again soon. Oh God, help us, Jesus. Help us to be stirred tonight in our hearts. Help us to be stirred in our faith. May we not grow weary in well-doing. May we not be complacent. Lord, may we stand strong. May we be resilient, Jesus. May we not be weary in well-doing, for we shall reap if we faint not. Lord, I pray, strengthen us and encourage us all. If you have a need, just lift up your hand by an act of faith tonight. Lord, we just praise you and we thank you, God. Lord, that we're fearfully and wonderfully made in the image and the likeness of God. And Lord, you know all about us. Lord, you know every need that is represented here tonight. Lord, I pray whatever that need is, physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, financially, relationally, God, whatever it is, Lord, that you would just begin to minister and meet and make a way that, in a way that only you can, God. Restore our hearts. Pour in your oil and wine, the kind that restores our souls. And Lord, those who need a physical touch in their body, Lord, touch everyone. Lord, we pray for Brother Mike. Lord, we pray for Pastor Kenny Knight, Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray for Pastor John Hoyt tonight, God. We pray for everyone who needs a touch in their body. Lord, we know that you are Jehovah Rapha, our healer. Lord, you sent your word and healed our disease. And Lord, by your 39 stripes, we were healed. God, we thank you for the completed work of the cross. And Lord, we just thank you, Father. We thank you, Jesus. Lord, that you love us so much. Lord, you desire that relationship with each and every one of us. And Lord, what a privilege it is, God, to have a living, loving, intimate relationship with you. And God, we just want to love on you, Jesus. We just want to take time for you, Jesus. Lord, we not only want to be busy about your work, but we want to be busy in relationship with you. We want to be busy in love with you, Jesus. 
Lord, we want to make time for you every day in your word and through prayer and meditation, devotion, God. Lord, we just thank you for calling us. We thank you for choosing us. We thank you for loving us. Lord, have your way. Lord, use us for your glory and for your honor. Even the remainder of this week, God, anoint us for service. Equip us for battle. Use us for your glory and for your honor. And Lord, we will be quick to give you all the praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Can somebody say praise the Lord tonight? Woo, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord bless you. We love you. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord. We'll see you Sunday morning. Hallelujah.